Well, good morning again. Good morning. Ooh, that's very loud. Okay, uh, a million things running through my head. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, um, but I'm remembering. I'm remembering uh, days of old. So our previous church we went to is called Waypoint, and Waypoint was part of a denomination that wasn't part of the national denomination because. Um, it was part of the American Baptist churches, and they decided that they didn't have, want to have any direct oversight of any churches at all. And therefore, some of those congregations, can we say, went sideways. Let's say it that way. They went sideways, and they adopted practices that we would say were unbiblical, and they began to do things that we would say were heretical. And thus, the, there were a group of churches here along the West Coast that were a part of the American Baptists, that broke off and they said, mm, we're not gonna be a part of you anymore. We're gonna name ourselves something new, something edgy, something trendy, something uh, that speaks to this day and age. So they called themselves Growing Healthy Churches. And so that's the name to this day of a group of churches up and down the West Coast that have a pretty uh, foundational view of scripture and so on and so forth. And I tell you that story to say this, once upon a time, the pinnacle uh, virtue in church world and church leadership at every conference you went to, the pinnacle virtue of churches was church growth. If you want to verify this, you can go on pretty much any Christian bookseller and type in church growth. And what you will find is hundreds of books that will tell you how to grow your church, how to have a better church, a healthier church, a bigger church, a flashier church, uh, this church, more smoke, more mirrors, more this, more that, whatever you want, anything you desire, somebody will tell you how to do it in the church growth world. And the reality is church growth isn't up to us. When I first interviewed there, this is a church that um, had seen a pinnacle of like 700 Congregants. It was a big church in Richmond, and they had had a steady decline coming from the 1990s until the time I showed up. When, when Suzanne and I first appeared, there were fewer than 50 in their congregation. I sat down in the interview, and one of the first things an interviewer asked me, how are you going to grow our church? And I said, I'm not. And she looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, wait a minute. It's not my job to grow the church. In fact, I can do everything correctly and it will not grow, or I can do everything horribly and it will grow because it's up to God whether the church grows or shrinks. What happens in the context of the church is God's business. Now, we are here to walk in obedience. We're here to do what he's commanded us to do. We're here to, to lead and shepherd and do all that he has asked of us. So my job, obey God, preach the truth, shepherd the flock, equip the saints, and so on, and other duties to be named later. Um, and and that, those are all within my job description. What isn't in my job description is growing the church. That's God's business. If you want to see it for yourself, uh, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. That's where we're going to be today, Acts chapter 6, uh, verses 1 to 7. And what we're going to see is that when God is moving, he just puts everything else aside and he does what he wants. And that is a clear uh, aspect of this passage in Acts chapter 6. So Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1, say amen if you're there. Amen. Most of you, okay, most of you are there. So this is from the net version, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now in those days, when the disciples were growing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews against the native Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called the whole group of the disciples together and said, it is not right for us to neglect the word of God to wait on tables, but carefully select from among you, brothers, seven men who are well attested, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this necessary task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, the proposal pleased the entire group, so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, with Philip, Prechorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a Gentile convert to Judaism from Antioch. 
They stood, these men, before the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly, and a large group of priests came, became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, your servant, Luke, who, who wrote these things down for us to be an example for us, to help us to understand how church ought to operate, that, that so many truths are here, and I pray that your spirit would reveal truth to us. Help me, Lord, as I preach your word, to preach it with accuracy and the power of your spirit so that all of us might hear the word, have it sink into our hearts, to walk in obedience to the word, and make decisions based on the word. I pray that you'd be with us this morning. Give us uh, ears to hear and eyes to see, a mind to believe, and, and, and a heart that would be filled so that we would do what you've asked. We trust in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is a situation that should have been traumatic. It should have been traumatic. The Bible is full of places that talk about how we're supposed to care for orphans and widows. And by the way, you should go and see the film that Pastor John and his family are, uh, have supported and, 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 and brought to our theater. You should go see that because it's an encouragement for the church to care for orphans. Um, but we also know we're supposed to care for widows. And in this case, there was a rift a language rift between the two groups in the church. And so some of the widows were being cared for well, and some of them weren't being cared for well. And if you could ever imagine a situation that would, would should, could cause a fight within the church, it's the fact that there was plenty and there were widows who weren't getting enough. And that should cause a fight, right? That should be worthy of a discussion <laughs> with strenuous language. And so it, it, it was, and it was causing tension in the church, and the church leaders dealt with it. But I just, want to, I just want to think about if the Holy Spirit hadn't been involved. Can you imagine what would have happened to the first church of Jerusalem? The rift would have grown. There would have been a split. There would have been backbiting and fighting and accusation one against the other. And, oh, they said they were going to do this, but they didn't, and they failed. And, and, and all the kind of nonsense that humans are really good at. In fact, we're still really good at it, and we still see it all the time in our world today. We see churches that are torn apart for, for things that are much less important than the fact that widows were not being cared for. And so what I want to say is, we got to begin with this idea. God was at work here. He was doing miraculous things here. And, and the chosen 12 made good decisions and they were wise in their behaviors. But it was only because the Holy Spirit was at work. I want to start with that. So we have a growing church. Acts chapter 15, uh, chapter 1, verse 15 tells us that it started with 120 disciples. Like the Lord Jesus, when he was still walking the earth, we know about the 12, and then there were more gathered on, and more gathered on, and more gathered on. And, and later, of course, we know that Judas was, um, well, he was excommunicated from the 12 based on his behavior, but then ultimately he died, and they replaced him with someone. They replaced him with Matthias. Matthias, who had been there to witness it himself, had been a part of the group, even though he wasn't one of the 12, or at least the original 12. So there were all these people that were, that were around Jesus, that were around the disciples, and that group, we figure, was about 120. And they're the ones who met in the upper room, and the Holy Spirit came down like tongues of fire and showed up, and then Peter preached the great first sermon. And so the church didn't just grow, it exploded from 120 to around 3,000, according to Acts 2.41. So then we have a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, massive 3,000-member church that is growing all the time. Humans don't grow the church. God grows the church. And so what we see in Acts chapter 5 is more and more believers in the Lord were added to their number. 
crowds of both men and women. That's chapter 5, verse 14. And then we see here again at the beginning of our passage in chapter 6, the disciples were growing in number. And again at the end of our passage in verse 7, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly. So if it had 3,000 in chapter 2, and then some untold number added in chapter 5, and then again, another untold number added in chapter 6, verse 1, and who knows how many more in chapter 6, verse 7. Could there be 15,000 members to this church? Possibly 20,000? We have no idea. What we know for sure is the church is huge. It's huge and unwieldy. And there are so many people that there must be so many opinions about what should be done, what shouldn't be done. Uh, how come those people are a part of the church? Don't you know that they're bad people and these people? And uh, did you hear what they said to those other people? And there could have been so many rifts and segmented chunks of the church and this church really battling against this other church and separation and anxiety and, and, and who's going to be the leader and we want them to be our leader and how come they don't get to be our leader and so on and so forth. And we fight against this today, don't we? We fight against this all the time. When the church grows, there are so many opportunities for division and strife new opinions coming in all the time. Some of these, uh, it even says right down here in verse 7, that um, the word continued to spread and the disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Can you imagine adding priests to this group that's already got a million opinions and now the priests come marching in and they're like, oh, by the way, you're all doing it wrong. I know, because I was trained how to do this. And every one of you is doing it wrong. Let me tell you how to do it the right way. But, but that's not what happened. It's not what happened. Because the Spirit of God was at work. And I just think this is extraordinary and it's worth fighting for. The unity of the church, regardless of what's happening with the membership. There's unity and it's worth it. So what we see is the church is growing. There's a large group, and there are multiple ethnicities. Um, I, I read from the net version, and the net version kind of goes out of its way to describe these groups a little bit. And so your uh, verse 1 may be different than mine. So mine says, in those days when the disciples were growing, a number of complaint rose on the part of the Greek-speaking Jews, or the Hellenists, maybe yours says something like that, okay? And so the Greek speaking, the Hellenists is a, is a, is a subgroup of Judaism that would have adopted Greek um, language and some Greek customs and, and, and Greek mentalities, and they would have been opposed to, or in a different mindset at the very least, with the native Hebraic Jews, those who had stayed in Jerusalem and been steeped in Judaism from their roots in the culture and using the language. And so there would have been some separation there that would have naturally happened because, um, as any linguist will tell you, and, and Carolyn and Reese have gone on to, to bless the children by teaching in the Sunday school, but, but as any linguist will tell you, the heart language of a person says so much about how they think and about what their culture is. And so we've got people in here um, where maybe English is your second language, and if English is your second language, your heart language would be what you um, connect with most in terms of your culture and your identity. And so this is really two different churches, two different groups of people with different language and different mentality and different methodology and how are they ever going to work together? Well, they, they figure it out. And so we see that the, the Hellenists' widows are being overlooked. And people are complaining. And unity is threatened. And this is such a powerful lesson for church leaders. So I'm going to skip ahead in my notes because I can. I've been at this uh, professional ministry thing for, for more than 15 years. 
I've been a teacher my whole adult life. And in both of those separate uh, worlds that I come from, one of the things that I have come to realize is that most people don't think of themselves as leaders. A few do, and, and very often the few that do think of themselves are, as leaders are the ones that you don't want because their, their natural gifting and leadership also inflates their head to a, a, an overlarge size. And so, this is always a battle in, con in the context of church leadership is you're trying to find people who have some gifting but who aren't, um, th their pride is not out of control. Okay, that's the simple way to say that. And, and by the way, continue to pray for me that my pride doesn't get out of control because I stand here in front of you week after week and it would be easy for my head to expand. And so, pray for me. But in this context, what we see is that the church leaders have a dilemma. There is a very legitimate complaint that's been brought to them, and they now have to make a decision about how to proceed. These widows are being overlooked. What are you gonna do about it? And I gotta tell you, as a church leader, it, it, putting myself in that position, I would have been scared. If I do this, these people are going to get irritated. If I do this, these people are going to get mad. If I don't do anything, well, then maybe they'll just go away. Or maybe they'll just isolate and they'll take care of themselves and I won't have to deal with it. It's easier to not deal with something than it is to deal with something. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was a baseball coach and then I became an umpire. And I did umpire training. Why do, you, why do you care? I did umpire training, and one of the first things they teach you in umpire training is it's easy to call a ball because you just stand behind the catcher, and when the ball comes in to the catcher and the catcher catches it, you don't say or do anything, and it's a ball automatically. So if you don't do anything, it's a ball. On the other hand, it's hard to call a strike because you have to see it, you have to recognize it, you have to think about it, you have to uh, utter something, say something. And then you get all kinds of weird, you know, baseball calls. If you're a baseball fan, say hello. Okay, never mind. Uh, I'll find a different analogy. I'll find a different analogy. Um, it's easy to do nothing. That's the truth. It's easy to do nothing. It's hard to do something. And as a church leader, there are so many things that come in. And you think, should I do something or should I do nothing? I could do nothing. If I do nothing, will something bad happen? How do I know when to do something? And when I do something, how do I know what to do? Oh God, speak to my heart, speak to our hearts, help us. Fortunately, we were put in the context of eldership and biblical eldership is a group of men who meet together, who love each other and who make decisions collectively. And so that's what we have going on. And so when we meet together and we think about, do we do something or do we do nothing? At least there are multiple brains at work, multiple hearts connecting with God, working together to make decisions. And in this case, the men did it right. First thing they did, first thing they did, um, verse two. So the 12 called the whole group of disciples together. That would be terrifying. Can you imagine? How many thousand people are there all of a sudden? I hope you have a big auditorium. 15,000 people come in, and about half of them are mad at you, walking through the door, right? Okay, well, what are we going to do now? So gather the people together, and be honest. This is happening. There is a problem. We need to figure it out. And so a lot of times, the most important thing church leaders can do is uh, get together, figure out what they're going to do, call the people together, and say, there is an issue that's happening, and we're not going to ignore it. We're going to figure it out. And pray, and ask God to give wisdom, and make decisions. So, verse 2 again. So the twelve called the whole group of disciples together and said... It is not right for us to neglect the word of God to wait on tables, but carefully select from among you brothers, seven men who are well attested, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this necessary task.
task. So they gathered the people together and they said specifically, there is an issue and we have a proposal. Here's the proposal. You all get together, talk it out, and come up with seven men who can be in charge of this. Seven men, and not just seven men, okay? It's not just any seven guys who are willing to do this. It's seven men who have, who have three different um, attributes. The first one in verse three, it says, well attested, or they have a good reputation. They have to have a good reputation. The second one is full of the spirit. They have to be full of the spirit. And the third one is wisdom. They need to be wise. They need to be wise. So they gather together. They say, here's what you're going to do. Choose seven from among you who can take this on. Seven who would volunteer for it. Seven who have good reputation, are full of the Holy Spirit, and have wisdom. And so they state that, and they get that out there, and they find the solution. And what the scripture says is that their proposal met with favorability among the people, like they're all like nodding their heads. Yes, that sounds like a really good idea that we should put seven guys in charge of this. And so they uh, generate the congregational input because the congregation is proposing the seven guys and the seven leaders from among them. And so verse six, what we see is that they stood these men before the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. So my understanding of this is the congregation chose the seven, but it was the apostles who verified their decision. They said, these seven men do seem to have a good reputation. They do seem to be full of the Holy Spirit and they do seem to have wisdom we 12 will now lay our hands on them and pray for them and commission them to do the work. And so they began to do the work. Have you ever read the Bible and, and, and thought, how come it didn't talk about, how come it didn't talk about my need? How come it didn't talk about this? How come this isn't in there? I have a whole section here in my notes and, it's, and, and the section is called, what's not in the text? I wish sometimes I would, <laughs> you guys have all been there too. Like, don't you wish once in a while you could pick up your cell phone and dial Paul's number and say, okay, look, Paul, I was reading Romans 6 and, and it says this. Um, can you tell me what that means? Because I don't really, I don't know, I'm not really sure. And even the scholars are not sure. And there's debate among people and I don't really know what's going on. We could call up Luke and put him on a conference call and say, okay, Luke, when this happened, how did you choose the seven? How did you choose the seven? Did, did you guys line up all the men and then have somebody turn around and throw a beanbag in the air and the first one to catch it, he was number one and, and you did that seven times? Is that how you chose? Like, how did you pick this? Did you have, was it just the Hellenists who got to pick? Because they were the, you know, being picked on. And so they're the ones who are like, oh, we're putting seven of our guys on this committee. Mm-hmm. Right? Or, or, or did you have some other, it doesn't say. Did the men volunteer? Or did somebody say, I picked John. He's on my team. You guys can pick now. And then it was just like uh, at recess when you're playing when you're playing touch football and you pick one like I, how did I don't know the Bible doesn't tell us if they were volunteers or if they were nominated the Bible doesn't tell us if there was a vote the Bible doesn't tell us if seven of them were Greek or or five of them were Greek or or three were he doesn't tell us how how many of each we can kind of guess based on the names that there were maybe more Greek than there were Hebrew, but, but we don't know for sure. We're just guessing. We don't know how the breakdown went. We don't know if there were more than seven nominees. We don't know if they put 10 up and, 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 and handed out pieces of paper and said, write down seven names. Like, we don't know how it went. We just know that the Spirit got what he wanted. The Holy Spirit showed up, and the Holy Spirit popped seven men out of the group and brought them to the front. And those, and those men were verified by the leaders of the church, the 12, the apostles. Here at United, we also have growing needs. Our church is growing, which is good, 
right? Our church is growing and it is good. And we have growing needs. And so one of the things that I want to I want to highlight for us all is that in Acts 6, they don't pop seven guys up for leadership until there's a need. It's the need that generated the call for these seven. You see that? Like they don't just say, okay, well now we need seven more leaders. So let's pick seven. It's like there's an issue and we need to address it and we need new leadership because our church has expanded to the point where there's a new issue and we need new leadership. And so we're going to appoint new leaders to take on new tasks. Our church is growing and we're always in need of new leadership to take on new tasks and new members to take on more responsibility. So, if I asked you how many of you feel strongly that you are natural gifted leaders, probably four of you would raise your hand. And, 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 and then there would be many of you who looked around and were like, well, sometimes I think I'm a leader and sometimes I don't think I'm a leader. And then most of you would be like, I'm not a leader, don't call on me, don't ask me, don't look in my general direction. I don't even like to be near the word leader. God help me. Well, the truth is, um, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have some experience in his church, then you have some leadership. Here's what I mean. When Jesus was on his way out, he gave us a great commission, and everybody has this memorized because we talk about it every week. Go to the, what, Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends of the earth, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and then what? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Everyone who has a relationship with Jesus is capable of teaching somebody who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. Every one of us. Every one of us is a leader. Ha <laughs> ha, I win. Um, so, so, at that level, right, we're all leaders at some, in some way. And even if, even if you're a parent, you're leading children. So, so all of us have some ability to lead at some level. And some of us are given more natural leadership than others, and that's the reality of humanity. And so some of you have leadership that you're not currently using. You have leadership gifting that you're not using. And you may think, but Chris, I'm not a leader. And I'm saying, God can use you anyway, whether you think you're a leader or not, whether you feel comfortable with the term, or not. We need more leaders. So most people don't think that they're leaders. Some people who think that they are shouldn't be because their head, right, we talked about this, their heads would get too big. Um, but finding leaders is difficult. And let me give you an example. Each year, we nominate a, a, a couple, two, three, four new elders. Do you guys know who the next group ought to be? Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. That's a difficult thing because what? The, the biblical qualification for an elder, it, the bar is high. The bar is high. An elder needs to be above reproach. An elder needs to be wise and discerning. An elder needs to be able to teach. It's in the scriptures. So the bar is high for that one and not everyone's going to qualify. That's the truth of the matter. And so we need to be wise and discerning about how we select our elders. That's a big deal. But elder is not the only leader within the context of our church. There are many other kinds, shapes, sizes, differentiations of leadership. Some people are leaders in ministries. We've got a, a variety of ministries, men's ministries, women's ministries. We've got youth ministry. John, are you needing more leaders? Yes, probably needs. Particularly, John has talked to us at staff meeting on multiple occasions. I need a young-ish woman who's willing to go on trips because we go on a trip and I can sleep in the, in the room with all the dudes and I need somebody who's able to sleep in the room with all the girls. Like Something like that is really helpful. How much leadership do you need? A little bit, a lot, mm, not necessarily a lot, but some. 
So we need more leaders in youth ministry. We need more leaders in children's ministry. I think uh, men's ministry is always looking for more leaders, right, Joe? Yes, amen. So we need more leaders. We need people who are just willing to step into it. Now here's one of the things that happens when I say stuff like this. People as a general rule will say something like this. Well, if Pastor Chris wanted me to do be a new leader, he would ask me. He would he would like call me up and come to my house, and we would have dinner together, and he would make a proposal for leadership, and he would tell me how valuable I am and how important I am, and how much the church needs me to step into ministry and, and take care of these important things, and so on and so forth. And 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 I gotta tell you guys, ready? I can't do that. I can't be at 110 people's house for dinner. Like, that's not realistic. So, if you're not serving currently, I'm talking to you. You can be a leader in this church. There are places for you. And we need all kinds of things done. Like, one of the things that we need done the most, ready for this? We need somebody to roll up their sleeves and wash dishes for potlucks. And you're like... Oh, I don't want to do that job. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Well, you don't need much leadership, but you do need elbows. Um, so, so we, you know, so many things going on with us. Okay, so here are actual needs. Not just generic needs, specific needs. If you're a note taker, here you go. I think we still need some... Uh, Children's ministry still needs a nurse, another nursery worker to be in rotation and another che- teacher to be in rotation. The youth ministry, in fact, multiple ministries, multiple ministries need food. Food. Um, the, the, the youth, uh, Youth United, that's our youth group name. Youth United eats a meal together every week starting in the fall. What, when do we start? Like September? 15th. September 15th. We need somebody to bring food to the building every week. Now, some of you are saying, but I'm not a very good cook. Me neither. Okay? But um, um, Kentucky Fried Chicken, I think, does cook food for you, and you can pick it up and bring it here, right? Um, Papa Murphy's cooks food for or they make food, and you can bake it here. There are, there are other ways to do You can go to the, to the store and the big deli counter. You've seen the big deli counter, right? And they have, like, prepared foods, and they have salads, and they have things. You can buy stuff, ready, and then bring it. That's how I would do it, because cooking is not my thing, but eating is, so I figured out how to eat even if I don't cook, and, and you, should, you should figure that out too. We need food. We need people who can do that. We need people who can do trips and things, um, and then there's this whole other thing that I was thinking about as I was praying about this message. I'm like, okay, God, what else? And he's like, when was the last time you sent missionaries from your church out of here? I think the women's ministry sent a group to Chihuahua, right? There are a few people nodding their heads, yeah. But how long ago was that? How many years ago? Two years ago? Three, two, two, three, two, two. It's two. It's two years ago, Chris. Quit it. Okay, two years ago, we sent some women to Chihuahua to do a ministry, a support support ministry there. And then how many um, other people have been on a... Raise your hand if you've been on a, on a short-term missions trip, okay? M- many of you, right? Raise your hand if you've been on a short-term ministry trip in, in the last two years. Okay, t- three, three or four. So I think that there is a need for a genuine ministry leader, right, Harry? Somebody who can step in and has a vision for doing short-term missions, with our people. Say so, amen, if you would go on a short-term mission trip. Amen. We'll take it. So, um, many people would be willing to go on a short-term mission trip if we had a visionary leader who could put it forward, put it together. 
So we need somebody who's visionary, who could, who could see a need somewhere in their prayer life, see a need, and God's going to send a group from this church to go and meet a need or do teaching or whatever the case may be, a short-term mission trip. Then we're going to need people to lead that trip. It's one thing to envision it. It's another thing to lead it. Okay, so we'll probably need different people to do different aspects of this kind of thing where we have somebody who's like, well, I don't know where to go and I don't know how to get there, but I'm absolutely willing to take time off work and lead the trip. I have that kind of mentality. I know how to ask people, where's your passport? Show me your passport. I would need to see it. Before you get in the van, you have to show me your passport. We're not going to get to the airport and fly to Mexico and you don't have your passport. That's not happening, right? We need people who have that, that, that desire and that drive and that energy and they want to do, they want to lead missions trips. And maybe it's a team of people who work together and they're like, okay, well, I'm really good at raising money. And somebody else is like, I'm really good at spending it. We should get together and we can do a mission trip and figure out how to be a blessing to to our people and the kingdom of God. Let's, let's, let's generate some, some enthusiasm around missions, not just, of course, not just uh, locally, which is amazing, and we should continue to support local missions, but also internationally. We can send people to be a support to missionaries, and we can have short-term missions trips. We also need more people who um, don't really feel called to be a visionary leader for trips and they don't necessarily feel called to leading trips internationally or even locally, but they do feel called to read uh, newsletters and give reports on the missionaries we're currently supporting, like people who could join the missions committee, which I think is three people, Harry, or four currently? Four, and they could use at least two more. And, and, the, and the ideas are pretty straightforward. Like the big thing on that committee is to read the newsletters as they come in so they understand who our missionaries are, where they're serving, and how to support them, right, Ruthann? And, and how to support them and encourage them and keep in contact with them and, and, and then tell the church about what's going on to help us remember. We're supporting, we're currently supporting I don't even remember how many, eight or 10, what, 11, I was close. Okay, 11 missionaries right now, and then we need somebody else who's, who's able to um, connect with new people, because we've always got new missionaries standing up and saying, can you support me? And we have to be able to evaluate, well, should we support this person or not? Do they, have, uh, do they meet with these qualifications? Do they have this vision for their, for their ministry and so on and so forth? And we need people who are able to do that work. And here he says he needs two more people for his team. He needs two more people. So missions is, it's happening. I just want it to happen more. I want it to happen more. I hope you're with me on that. Um, there, there are so many other ministries that I want to encourage, and one of the things I'm going to jump up and down for again and again and again is Alpha. Um, there, there's a group already started to do Alpha, and if you don't know about Alpha, it is uh, an internationally recognized evangelistic program, and Alpha needs somebody to cook for them every week, or not cook, but bring food anyway. Right, we talked about that. We need somebody to bring food for the youth. We need somebody to bring food for Alpha. We need a location where Alpha can meet. Alpha should be, if it's done right, it should be about 15 people who get together every week and some of them are believers who have a, a good foundation in who Christ is and what the scripture teaches. And most of them are what we're gonna call guests, people who are spiritually curious or people who, have, were, who grew up in the church and then they left the church for one reason or another. They're what we call the de-churched, ones who came and left. And we're trying to share the gospel with people who are willing to hear it. People who are willing to listen. People who are willing to engage in the conversation. And we need more leaders in Alpha, and we need people who are willing to bring food, and we need people who are willing to specifically stop what they're doing each week and pray for Alpha. And so if you have questions about Alpha, um, let me know, and we can talk about it more. But we need food, and we need, uh, in a perfect world, we would have a couple of hosts that were youngish. Um, so youngish means like maybe 
under 50? Okay. I know, that's, that doesn't sound right. Um, my previous church, uh, my senior pastor, whatever age he was, was the line. And if you were older than him, you were old. And if you were younger than him, you were young. I happen to be 50. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm young or old. I'm just saying uh, we, need some, we need some youngish people who are willing to serve in that ministry and connect with people. We also need, frankly, we need more servants. People who don't want recognition, they don't want to be on the stage, they don't want to lead a meeting, they just want to serve. And we need more people who are willing to serve. Um, our potluck team needs more dishwashers and just hands, right, Connie? We just need more people who are willing to help. Help, you know, it, like, it doesn't take a master's degree in theology to wipe dirty tables down. It takes a washcloth and elbows. And we need people who are willing to give of their time and energy to do things like that. Wipe down tables, uh, wash dishes. We have a chair team. Did you know this? We have a chair team. Why? Because this room gets used for so many things. And the chairs get pushed to the side, then they get put back, and pushed to the side, and they get put back. And what happens is the chair team gets tired because the chairs are heavy. <laughs> So we need more people to join the chair team. Like, it sounds so silly, but we need people who are just willing to use uh, the, the body God's given them to do uh, work for his glory. And so we need more people on the chair team, um, and, and we need more people who are willing to just serve in a variety of things. One of the other things I was thinking about as I was praying about this is um, we have an ever-increasing number of shut-ins. And, and so if you're at home right now and you're watching, we love you. We're glad that you're able to join us in this way. You're still a part of this church. Amen, church? Amen. So one of the things we need is people who are willing to go and visit. Just go to people's homes and visit them. Go to people's homes and visit them. One of the ministries that happened in a previous church of mine is that there was a specific communion for shut-ins. And if somebody would go and visit and bring a little kit, and it had grape juice, right, and unleavened bread, and they would just sit, and they would read a passage of scripture and pray, and they would experience communion together. And it's something we can do here. You know, all it takes is time and love. Like, those are the things it takes. It takes time and love. And so if that's, if that's something that speaks to your heart, you know, even if you just visit two people a month, that would, you know, that would be amazing. And, and if 10 people did that, I think all of our shut-ins would be able to have communion brought to them and have someone lay hands on them and pray for them. And we could commune in that way. So... We need people who are just willing to serve. I just want to encourage us in Scripture one more time with 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because I think this is the heart of the matter for us all. For just as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so too is Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, and we are all made to drink of the one spirit. For in fact, the body, the body is not a single member, but many. And the reality is, we need everybody. We need everybody. The body doesn't operate if all its members aren't functioning properly. We need everybody. So grab your calendars. Oh, wait. Seriously, get your smartphones out. Come on, get your smartphones out. Uh, because now I have primed the pump and on, on September 8th, I'm going to lock the door. I mean, I'm going to encourage you strongly after I finish preaching to go and sign up. On September 8th, we're gonna have a ministry fair. We're going to have tables and booths. We're going to have ministry leaders who are begging people to come and join. And it'll be an opportunity for you to put your money where your mouth is. 
It'll be an opportunity for you to connect with ministry leaders and say, tell me about your ministry and how can I pitch in and what can I do to help? And it'll be an opportunity for the church to really connect with one another and to grow in our leadership. Ministry Fair, September 8th. September 8th. September 8th. So, uh, once the 12, oh yeah, back to our passage. Once the 12 had appointed the seven, what happened next? Once the 12 appointed the seven, what happened next? Verse six. They stood these men before the apostles who prayed and placed their hands on them. Verse seven. The word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. The plan worked. Once the 12 brought the people together, said this is the issue, we see there's a problem, we want to address it, here's our proposal. The congregation worked together in harmony and unity. They, they encouraged seven men to step forward those seven were, were what? They had a good reputation, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they uh, had wisdom. And they stepped forward, and the apostles laid hands on them and prayed for them. And what happened next is the church continued to grow. The church continued to grow, and I think, isn't that what we all want? We want the church to grow spiritually. We want the church to grow numerically. We want the church to grow. And so we, like the 12, like the seven, like the congregation in the book of Acts, are just seeking God. God, help us, give us direction, show us the way forward. The plan worked because the people were obedient to the Lord. So we see new leaders were commissioned and the, the widow's needs were met and unity was preserved and the word of God continued to spread. And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. In conclusion, growing the church is not my job. It isn't. Only God can grow the church. Only God can grow the church. Right? What is it Paul said? Uh, Apollo, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, and God caused the harvest. God brought the increase. God grew the church. And that's our prayer, is that God would grow our church, not because um, I need an ego boost, but because he is glorified when people come to faith. He is glorified when people who don't walk with him repent and turn to him. He is glorified. It's not my job to grow the church. It's my job to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's my job to give a shepherd's care for the flock it's my job to give effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. It's your job to do the work of ministry. And it's your job to express your gifts as a member of the body. And it's your job to love God and love one another, to know God and to make him known. So I'm done preaching now, but our time of worship is not over. I'm going to call.